Thank you. We take up seven countries in Southeast Asia and uh, look back, look the history of uh, station building in the 20th century. Myanmar, Indonesia, and the Philippines and Singapore uh, will be discussed today in Southeast Asia. There are ch changes uh, all the time, and we would like uh, speakers to discuss what sort of changes are taking place and how we should interpret them and how we look at them from the history perspective. Now we would move on to uh, the speech first from uh, Georgi uh, Sofia University. Uh, Professor Nemoto will discuss uh, Myanmar. I was in charge of the uh, 17th uh, chapter of this book on station building of Burma. I have to first uh, regret that's to say that I regret uh, that I could not uh, foresee the coup nor the, the development uh, after that. Six months has passed uh, since uh, the military coup in Myanmar. I could not predict not only the coup, but the post-coup spread of civil disobedience movement, mainly carried by the Generation Z and the killing of more than 890 people by the armed forces crew of crackdown. Although I have studied modern and current history of this country for almost 40 years, I figured that Myanmar will move toward democratization and economic growth while the military maintained their privileges after the 2011 transfer to civilian control. Therefore, when I discussed state formation history of this country between latter half of the 19th century to 2018 in chapter 17 of this book, I, pointing out national challenges to overcome, I did not write that soon there might be a danger of a third coup by the military, because I did not expect the possibility of the armed forces pulling this country back to military ruled politics in a short period of time due to their dissatisfaction of the election result, in spite of their overwhelming advantageous position based on the Constitution. In my chapter, I started uh, explaining the process of fundamental transformation from a dynastic state to a modern state building. Uh, the British colony period of 1886 to 1948, in which the idea of grouping people by ethnicity was introduced. Then I discussed the process of state building from 1948 independence to 2018 by dividing this period into four stages. stages. And I extended my argument that after three setbacks in state building during this period, the country is facing a fourth challenge in the post-2011 uh, transfer to civilian control. Considering the post-independence parliamentary democracy period of 1948 to 1962 as a first stage, I explained the efforts of UNU government to achieve a step-by-step -step socialization of economy under a constitution based on civilian control at the time of independence. Military submitted to civilian co control at first, but when a civil war started right after independence, resulting in confusion and a dearth of defense budget, it started to dislike it gradually, and as a result, it started a coup in 1962 that quickly ended the civilian control of Myanmar. This was the first setback of post-independence state building endeavor. Second stage was a period of Burmese socialism promoted by the armed forces that lasted 26 years until 1988. One party ruled by the BSPP established by the army drove forward strengthening of Burmese nationalism by making citizenship law stipulating 135 indigenous ethnic groups centered on Burmese people as citizens, but it resulted in a dictatorship named Nay Wing significant economic stagnation, oppression of ethnic minorities, and the suppression of human rights. In 1988, it collapsed due to an upsurge of nationwide pro-democracy movement. So this was the second failure of stable state-building attempt. Third stage was an era of military rule from 1988 to 2011. 
pro-democracy movement of 1988 broke down a socialism regime but failed to make army. The army withdraw from polit political landscape uh, and to uh, revive civilian rule. The army, securing all powers by a second coup, did away with political ideo ideology and moved ahead to army centricity and maintained military rule for 23 years. It can be pointed out that the military may have recognized that it is not possible to expect a long-term economic growth just by controlling people by force. I describe this uh, third stage as the third setback in state building. Now, I discussed the uh, transfer to civilian control uh, period as the fourth stage in which a fourth attempt at state building took place. The current constitution solidly protects army's interests. Ministry of Defense, Home Affairs, and Border Affairs are placed under a commander-in-chief authority, and the scope of civil control is narrowly limited. So-called legal coup clause by which all powers can be dele dele delegated to the commander-in-chief when the president declares a state of emergency is included in the Constitution. And uh, there's a presidential uh, qualification clause which stops Aung San Suu Kyi to become uh, president. In legislature, 25 percent of both houses' seats are given to military personnel. It is not possible to propose an amendment of the Constitution that requires I votes of 75 percent plus one without military consent. So based on this Constitution, President Tin Sein, who assumed office in March 2011, moved toward democratization and economic reforms that amazed the international community. However, in a general election of November 2015, a National League for Democracy, led by Aung San Suu Kyi, had a landslide victory. She, not being able to be president under the Constitution, negotiated with the armed forces for suspension of this uh, presidential coordination clause, but failed. In consultation with assembly, uh, the Assembly, she created a new post of state councillor that can give instructions even to the president. Thus, a de facto administration led by her was born. It is needless to say that this increased dissatisfaction and anxiety of the military, but I could not fully grasp uh, how strong their discontent was when I was writing my chapter. I naturally pointed out that the problem of the military maintaining strong power in post-1962 Myanmar in my paper I also described that the 2011 transfer to civilian control was democratization from above by the army, and it was pseudo-parliamentary democracy in which civil control is limited uh, in various ways. However, by watching, watching the NLD's victory in 2015 election and a change to a civilian-centered government due to the creation of state council post, I thought the army will put up with the de facto Aung San Suu Kyi administration as long as they can retain the current constitution favorable to them. This was a big misunderstanding. The fourth challenge of state building failed because of the coup in 10 years. But I think it, is, uh, it seems necessary for me to doubt whether uh, I was right to take this 10 years as a period of challenge. So I regret not having been able to predict the coup, uh, nor the coup post-coup developments. In short, I underestimated political nature of uh, Generation Z, energetic uh, civil disobedience movement by mainly 20-something youth, and an active uh, campaign of the opposition NUD established with its help were unexpected to me. Due to the transfer to civilian control in 2011, economy developed favorably, and social liberalization progressed beyond comparison with the military rule era. We can say that generation, the Generation Z was a generation that grew up enjoying those benefits. Although I knew that they master social media and are good at disseminating information, I misunderstandingly thought that they do not have strong interest nor will in political matters such as national reform, since the they are keenly interested in their own self-actualization. To be honest, I was surprised that they showed a strong will to resist, develop the movement, and even began to seek fundamental remodeling of the state. 
their strong feelings are simply represented in the NUG's basic stance. They no longer think it's sufficient to return to the before the coup pseudo democratic system because they regard it as going back to the days that they were afraid of the military uh, that might start another coup any time. They are calling for a federal democratic regime for fundamental remake of the state so that eth uh, ethnic minorities have fair participation in politics. It is not easy to forecast future development six months after the coup. There is no doubt that army is trying to expel Aung San Suu Kyi and NLD from the political arena, redo a general election, and establish a government consisting of militar military personnel as its core members. But at this moment uh, in time, I cannot anticipate whether it will work according to their scenario or not. Even if it does, I do not think it will bring about prosperity in Myanmar. Having said so, I can point out two medium and long-term challenges of Myanmar based on my study of the nation formation history of this country. The first challenge is how to overcome exclusivism of the Burmese nationalism and instead create an inclusive identity as a federal nation. In other words, how to get over exclusionism born from a fiction of native people. Right now, 135 ethnic groups are classified and recognized. Uh, and this is centered on majority Burmese that treats the Rohingya as strangers. How to overcome this exclusivism? Without solving this problem, the con this country's democratization and ethnic issues will not move toward resolution in a stable manner. The another issue is how to revive civilian control, which collapsed all too soon after 14 years from independence. In 2011, limited civilian rule was revived, but the army kept refusing to yield to it. And the current coup shows this clearly. Regardless of the time it takes, it is, it is necessary to create a system in which the military will nev uh, never seize power nor get involved in politics. Amid the present crisis, we can say that Myanmar is facing this old and new problem. From now on, whether the army remains in power, unfortunately, or the opposition NUG gains power, fortunately, Myanmar cannot escape from these two challenges. Longer they postpone, further they will be left behind by growing East Asian countries. I end my presentation emphasizing this point. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Nemoto. In your writing, national integration was one of the points of a nation building. I had an opportunity to meet with the Myanmar researchers, Myanmar researchers. They did not expect the civil disobedience movement nor coup d'etat. So I think that this militarist movement or motive was, and the principle behind this was not easily understood by uh, rational thinking that all we have. I think we will discuss this later. Next, we have with us Dr. Nobuhiro Aizawa, Associate Professor of Kyushu University. He will be discussing about in Indonesia. Thank you, Dr. Suzuki, for the introduction. My name is Nobuhiro Aizawa of Kyushu University. In this project, I was in charge of uh, Chapter 15 of Volume 3, Describe it in Leisure. Thank you for the invitation. Today, the theme that is assigned to me is about the nation building of Indonesia challenges that they are faced with. The challenges that Indonesia is faced with do include a COVID-19 pandemic, uh, as has been reported by mass media. The situation is so uh, the deteriorating so that uh, some say that eventually the situation may become even worse than India. And uh, in the context of confrontation between the United States and China, democracy was considered to be more resilient 
under such circumstances. But some said that authoritarianism, authoritarian regime, would stand against those challenges, and therefore it used to be discussed uh, in the context of regime resilience. But uh, when we uh, try to uh, look toward the the outlook of the 21st century, uh, based upon East Asian history of 20th century, then. Uh, I would like to suggest a nation state resilience that should be focused on, and therefore it is quite timely uh, that this project was undertaken uh, to look back the history and look at the situation in country like Indonesia from nation state resilience, especially when it is under the the COVID-19 pandemic, and therefore among other crises, uh, the, especially under COVID-19 pandemic, we should consider the resilience of national integration and the nation state resilience. And Indonesia is prone to face such challenges because it consists of multiple uh, religions and multiple ethnic groups and suffered or experienced the colonialism. And therefore, Especially during 20th century, the Indonesian history is discussed as the political history of the crisis of division and overcoming them. And therefore, I'd like to discuss in a limited period of time how we can, how they can overcome those challenges. Simply put, there are three major challenges that Indonesia is faced with. In the short run, it is about the capacity of the nation or capacity of the administration. And in the midterm, the, in the past 15, 20 years, Indonesia has enjoyed uh, the economic growth. But now uh, they are faced with the trap of mid-income country, whether they can overcome that uh, trap and maintain democracy. And then in the long run, and in fact, uh, this has been uh, maintained since 20th century, whether they can successfully maintain uh, the nation state integration. The COVID-19 is going to uh, uh, generate uh, different kinds of crisis as a result. And also we are seeing the dynamism of international order and increasing instability within the society. And uh, those are the challenges that I'd like to discuss by referring back to 20th century. First, about the history of Indonesia and the nation-building history in a nutshell. Indonesia grew during stability, as Charles Stiggy states. Well, uh, the, some say that the war uh, creates and grow the nation. Indonesia also experienced uh, fighting for independence and there was uh, internal conflict, but as more dynamic or important uh, the mainstream, I would say that uh, when the nation state was being created, the various functions of administration, such as taxation, infrastructure, and the industrialization, or their health care, and then during the uh, what is called uh, the development uh, monopoly, the institution building, including inflate, uh, in infrastructure and others. And uh, the after uh, the, the Asian crisis, uh, the stability came. That is during the stability that the nation building was promoted. And as one of the indicators, we can refer to uh, the population of the civil, civil servants. We don't have uh, old statistics, but uh, under Suharto, uh regime from 1974 to 1994, uh, the number of civil servants was more than doubled. And uh, during 1989 to 2014, uh, during the economic uh, growth period, the civil servants increased by 10 percent. That is a proof of the willingness of the people to serve for the country. And uh, during that time, I would say that the capacity of the country was developed further. But then the question is how, why they are incapable of dealing effectively with uh, the pandemic. And also, 
the economic impact of uh, the pandemic has to be discussed, especially today, looking at uh, politics of Indonesia. Uh, they are now about to, uh, or they are wondering how they can overcome uh, the trap of the mid-income country. And uh, also their population is going to ex see the aging society and therefore uh, the, they, some wonder that uh, they may not be able to become affluent before they are aged. And therefore I would say that uh, the, the warning signal is now uh, blinking in front of them. And therefore, in the Jokowi administration, they try to induce investment from overseas under omnibus law. And uh, despite the complexity of relationship with China and China being considered as the origin of COVID-19, yet uh, they had no other choice but to uh, work closely with China. And sometimes it is uh, heavily criticized in Japan as well as in the United States about the, the priority placed on economic development. But I think that was inevitable given their uh, history of independence. In fact, during 20th century, their politi politics has shift, have uh, had shifted uh, from the politics of independence and uh, the revolution to uh, one under economic growth. And then uh, from uh, poverty alleviation and industrialization during 20th century, uh, they have been striving to grow their economy and now face with the trap of mid-income nation. And in fact, uh, the economic growth was behind the stability of the administration. And in fact, uh, the state is no longer viable without economic uh, development. And uh, it is economic development that gave legitimacy to the administration. And uh, the question is whether democracy is the constraint of the economic growth. Uh, this is a question that I don't have an answer to. And in fact, this is the new challenge that they are experiencing. And the first and foremost, in fact, uh, the in uh, writing down the article in the chapter that I was responsible for, the when they strive for integration of nation state, where the COVID-19 pandemic leads to instability of the society and the crisis of uh, the national integration, that's what we are concerned about most. But at least for now, they have not reached that critical state. The security is not uh, getting deteriorated. Uh, for instance, in the United States, uh, guns are very popular and sell very well, but uh, we are not seeing that. And the, I don't have an answer to that question why it is not the case. But uh, looking back uh, the nation building history during 20th century, as a reference to COVID-19 pandemic, the why the security is not deteriorated and that uh, the crisis of nation building is yet to arrive at. Uh, the In uh, trying to seek for the answer to this question, uh, the, I look back to the financial crisis back in 1998 when balkanization was uh, the, raised as a concern. But uh, again, that was not uh, the, the, the case uh, that did not come to a reality. In fact, uh, the current administration is trying to prevent uh, COVID-19 pandemic uh, from developing into uh, the, the, the crisis of the nation state. And uh, they, ha they embrace uh, the principles, the Panchasila that is the five principles. Uh, that were advocated uh, by uh, President Scarno and uh, the, uh, they are trying to embrace that once again and trying to prevent uh, from, prevent crisis from being developed, like for instance uh, the marginalization of the, the fundamental 
uh, the the Muslim or Islamic fundamentalism. And I would say that, in fact, uh, the Jacobi administration uh, seems to seek for uh, the return to the nation building integration politics of 20th century type. That is, when the balkanization was raised as a concern, but the unlike in the case of the uh, approach by the, the, the distribution of authority, Uh, they seem to uh, they focus more on the uh, central control. The, I mentioned about 10 percent increase of uh, civil servant uh, population from 1998 uh, to 2014. And uh, yet the population has grown even more. It has grown by 20 percent, and therefore uh, the, still the civil servants are not uh, enough uh, to deal with uh, the requirements of the people and maybe that is because of the uh, the distribution of uh, the ownership the of the governors to local uh, municipalities or local governments and therefore the, even when there are some local uh, issues experienced uh, that does not uh, result in the micronationalism or uh, the opposition against the central government. And in the absence of micronationalism, the because of the strong voice of the uh, Islamic fundamentalism, uh, that's because of uh, because of that reason they are trying to deal with the current crisis by the uh, centralized uh, authority. I am yet to uh, offer uh, the convincing conclusion, but I would say that uh, based upon the history of 20th century, at the time of the crisis, in order to uh, strengthen uh, the integration, the which regime uh, works better, uh, the governance, ownership, distribution, or central control? Uh, that's a question that I'd like to raise uh, through this project. Uh, this is old and yet viable question that I'd like to raise uh, in discussing in Niger. Thank you very much, Dr. Aizawa. The national integration and democratic regime are the two axes of describing the history of Niger. You also refer to the administration capacity, the outlook of a sustained economic growth, the multiple ethnic groups as well as the challenges uh, for Indonesia in nation building. In Indonesia, they have overcome the crisis of uh, division despite uh, multiple uh, the ethnic groups and religion and has grown to be the major power in this region. And yet, the, the concern over the or the crisis of the the national uh, division is still there. And thank you very much for your uh, very uh, convincing discussion. Now, Professor Yusuke uh, Takagi from GRIPS, uh, associate, uh, associate professor from GRIPS on the Philippines. Thank you. My name is Takagi. I would like to share my slides with you. I was uh, in charge of uh, Philippines political issues and the nation building. In the chapter before mine, Patricia Abnales uh, wrote another chapter, and uh, that's uh, establishment of modern nation, and I followed uh, his chapter. The difference is the uh, political issues and the nation state uh, uh, state building related issues are taken up by myself. I prepared this presentation in order to give this uh, presentation. What I wanted to do right in my book is summarized in this, how to regard nation building in the Philippines. My tentative answer is this was a centrifugal state building. 
there was a discussion on whether centralized or decentralized and state building, but I use a different word of a centrifugal state building in put it in other words. Nation, modernization of nation uh, took a pres a precedence over uh, that of uh, nation state. I think that's the characteristic of uh, nation building in the Philippines. In case of Southeast Asia, when most of the country's uh, uh, nation state building were actually attempted uh, during colonial rule, and the situation was the same in the Philippines at the end of 19th century. Uh, the, the, the origin of uh, colonial period that was established, that is the improvement of uh, opportunities of edu education. In other words, uh, nurture people so that they can uh, build the state in the future. That's, that took place after 1965. And those are the ones who actually took responsibility for nationalism. There is a book called uh, Imaginatory, Imagined uh, Communities. This is uh, sold in the Philippines. As you can see from the cover, very modern clothes. People wearing uh, modern clothes are on the cover, not the uh, national dresses. Tagalog uh, tribe, which is the majority in the Philippines, or Bisaya in the middle, uh, in Cebu, they have uh, specific uh, folkloric uh, dresses, but they are not uh, shown on the title. So rise of nationalism who wear modern Western clothes. And uh, nationalism actually rose uh, the, uh, because of the leadership of those people. And from 1996, this was a start of the uh, a movement. Actually, uh, America colonial rule by America by the um, by the USA was introduced in this sort of situation and uh, actually American colonial periods of parliamentary system and the centralized uh, bureaucracy were introduced uh, at the same time this is the historic uh, background and this is uh, my answer to the homework given to myself After 100 years from the period I discussed, there's a, ink, a spread of COVID-19. And after Indonesia, the Philippines situation is quite dire compared to uh, the WHO's uh, statistics. This shows uh, how cases increased and uh, its economic impact. Fiscal package. What sort of impact did it have on this uh, COVID situation? This circled in the red is the Philippines. 33, 34% is the uh, world average, and the Philippines is 10% uh, below the average. And the next to it is Indonesia, Cambodia, Malaysia, and Thailand. And Singapore has more uh, influence of fiscal uh, response to COVID-19 than the average. As I, uh, Professor Aizawa took up the administrative uh, capability, and in the Philippines, uh, there's a weakness of the administrative uh, capability. And uh, Professor Vinale discussed the reason and the origin of this situation. But in my chapter, I said, well, this country is not dysfunctional. Uh, there is uh, some uh, parts uh, which uh, function well. What is the result and outcome of uh, state building? 
one characteristic of uh, state bill, state uh, building is that the absence of violence or an even presence of uh, violence or national integration. And uh, Duterte's uh, war against uh, drugs, 10,000 people have been actually uh, killed. This is quite violent. But the Duterte government does, um, administration is supported by people because uh, economic prosperity continues. And the Japanese media does not actually take this up, but I want to show it. This is the number of killing by 100,000 population. East Asian countries, East Asian countries, world. The Philippines is highest. In t over other East Asian, uh, Southeast Asian countries, as well as from the world average, in terms of the number of uh, murder for 100,000 people. So that is why this is one reason why the Duterte administration is supported by people. Another is national integration. In case of the Philippines. Uh, there is weak uh, divi social division uh, based on uh, ethnicity. Religious. Religion is uh, actually a, a one important uh, pillar for national integration. But uh, what happens to those who do not uh, believe in uh, Christianism? It's uh, related to the Mindanao issue and the stability of a political system. Democracy actually uh, was unstable, and but the uh, president's uh, dominance of uh, politicians over bureaucrats or military never wavered. It's always the president who has control, and the military uh, actually followed the authority of the president. And after democratization, uh, outcome of next state building uh, can be seen in the progress of uh, s civil uh, movement, civil society. They actually create the NGOs and complement the administrative functions of the government and the state. I would not uh, touch upon economy because of the time constraint, but I would like to talk about the internal factors and the external factors which support the prosperity, stability, and democracy. Uh, the, those four prosperity factors for prosperity were globalization, and uh, those who shouldered it was technocrat. And whether the importance and of service industry or tertiary industry will continue or not, uh, there's a question mark. And regarding stability, actually politicians have take precedence over bureaucracy. But when uh, politicians go amok, is there any mechanism to control them? We are not sure. 2022, there's a presidential uh, election uh, planned. That is one point of focus, whether the next leader will try to revive democratic uh, governance or will follow the current auto autocratic uh, system. That has to be uh, studied further. Thank you very much. I live in Manila right now in the Philippines. COVID uh, issues, testing and the building of uh, isolation building and the va uh, vaccination. Private sector has a very important uh, role to play. So centrifugal uh, system might be uh, still in place in the Philippines. We should not uh, follow just uh, historical determ determination, determinationalism, but uh, there might be a uh, working of inertia. And this might uh, actually determine the current uh, so social status. 
kindly from the University of Kita Kyushu. We would like to hear about Singapore from Professor Tamura. Yes, thank you. And I'd like to share my screen, so kindly wait a little while. Can you see the screen? So uh, I'd like to say good afternoon and thank you for the invitation. And I'm going to talk about nation building in Singapore. Now, first of all, how should we understand Singapore as a nation? Uh, the, I'd like to first talk about the prolonged authoritarian regime, then observe the history of nation building which forms such a regime. Singapore is a city-state with a small land area, and as indicated in blue, uh, the human develop in uh, development index is number nine in the world, so they are an average society. And in terms of economic freedom, they are number one in the world. On the other hand, there is the PAP, People's a Action Party, who have uh, ruled for a long time, so that uh, there is uh, uh, quite a limit on political freedoms. So, how? long has PAP monopolized the political arena. This shows the unicameral parliamentary seats and after independence in 1965, from the general elections from 1968 to 1980, there were no members of the opposition in parliament. And even after this time, the PAP monopolized most of the seats and in the general election conducted last year in July, the opposition finally won two-digit seats. Singapore is an example where economic development and the affluence it realizes do not inev inevitably bring about democracy. So why are its people politically silent? First of all, it is because the people positively evaluate economic development and the clean government with little corruption. And also, there is a structure whereby uh, the opposition and critical forces cannot gain power. In other words, the election system is advantageous uh, to the PAP, and also uh, media is under the strict control of the state. All the major newspapers in Singapore are published by the same company and a government bureaucrat is a member of the corporate management. In other words, diverse and competitive reporting will not be conducted. In other words, in terms of the World Press Freedom Index, Singapore is ranked 160th. Also, thirdly, labor movement and student movements were pretty much wiped out in the beginning of the 1960s, and labor unions are organized with government leadership. Though there are no municipalities in Singapore, numerous resident organizations are established in each electoral district. And uh, institutionally, they are subsidiary organs of government administration, but only PAP parliamentarians can become advisors of resident organizations. And government funding does not reach resident groups in electoral districts which have elected opposition party candidates. In effect, these are organizations for the PAP's grassroots level control and supervision. Last is that you can arrest and uh, detain in indefinitely with the Internal Security Act. There is a case of a person arrested under this law and detained for as long as 32 years. And uh, this is because it is a small uh, city-state. We cannot forget that uh, that is uh, one of the reasons this is possible. So when did the author authoritarian one-party rule by the PAP materialize? It was not in 1965 after independence, but from the end of the 1950s to the beginning of the 1960s. Let us take a look there. That is, uh, uh, the military administration of Japan ends in August 1945, and Singapore reverts to a British colony. In the 1950s, 
political activities to acquire the right of self-government and independence increase. In other words, uh, there are two supporters, two major subgroups. One was represented by the first prime minister of Singapore, Lee Kuan Yew, a select handful of local elites of the time, lawyers and uh, doctors educated in English who became the minor government officials, and they were called English language function. The other were leftists who le labor and student movements, and they were called uh, the Chinese faction. The PAP formed in 1954 was a party realized with the collaboration of the English faction and the Chinese faction. And uh, uh, in order to gain power, uh, the uh, English faction needed the Chinese uh, faction with its popular space, and the Chinese faction uh, knew that their own registration would be denied, and therefore they worked with the English faction. However, for Britain, Singapore is the key cornerstone in uh, controlling uh, the South Sea Asia, and so the English uh, uh, faction supported this, and the Chinese faction opposed it, and the confrontation intensifies. And then in 1956, uh, there were security operations by Britain, and that uh, determines the political situation. And there is uh, uh, arrests of the Chinese faction, and uh, those who were arrested uh, could not uh, uh, qualify for the general elections scheduled for 1959. And this was a strong request by Lee Kuan Yew to the British colonial government. Also, uh, the um, party is divided into general members and the senior members, and the Central Executive uh, Committee has to agree to those who can become senior members, and also uh, the uh, only the cadre can participate in the party convention where the Central Executive Committee is elected, and this rule still stands. And in 1959, Singapore obtained internal self-government except defense and foreign affairs. And in the 1959 general elections accompanying the grant of uh, internal self-government, the PAP wins a landslide victory. And in the beginning of the 1960s, uh, there is a proposal to form a new federation of Malaysia. And the English faction wants to promote this. But the Chinese faction feels that uh, Singapore should first become independent, then negotiate the unification from an equal footing, and they set up a new party. And uh, PAP and the state organ become integrated, and uh, Lee Kuan Yew makes uh, speeches as the not as the secretary general of the PAP, but as prime minister, and publicizes the achievements of the party and the formation of the new federation. The opposition party is banned from using the media and restricted from gathering so that uh, they are deemed to be uh, dangerous elements and arrested under the Internal Security Act. The new Federation of Malaysia is formed immediately afterwards, but Singapore becomes a separate republic in 1965, achieving independence. What is uh, routinely conducted by the PAP after independence, that is, the state and party as a unit, the state acquiring party support, the coercive uh, containment of the opposition through the Internal Security Act, all started at this time. We can also understand that the PAP became a monolithic party with almost no possibility of internal division before gaining independence. After independence, the PAP government positioned Singapore as a vulnerable city-state since it is a small city-state with a majority Chinese population in a Southeast Asian island region dominated by Malays. And since Corp and that leads to further reinforcing of authoritarianism. Also, uh, the people are said to have patriotic sentiments and the spirit of self-sacrifice. Also, there's the multiculturalism, where all the uh, people are grasped in, into C for Chinese, M for MLA, I for Indian, and O for others. Though English is a common language, each language is treated equally, and culture and religion are also respected. However, this is also a policy to control the people by classifying them into four groups. And speech and behavior supporting or 
criticizing certain races or religion will be strictly controlled by the Internal Security Act. And also, the fourth is the realization of meritocracy to use the limited human resources to the fullest. And this has not changed uh, even today. And uh, uh, I'd like now to finally um, summarize the challenges of such nation building. I mentioned the CMIO classification of the peoples and how the identity of Singaporeans will be built up was n not uh, discussed. And it is said that the division of the people has been pro promoted. Also, there is no unemployment inf insurance or uh, minimum wages, and also there are foreign professionals uh, uh, coming into the country so that the gap between the rich and poor is more serious. And meritocracy is disadvantageous to the Malays who originally were engaged in fisheries and agriculture. The Internal Security Act is still maintained, and some people question whether arrests and detention were justified. But as I said at the outset, at the general election last year, uh, many people chose to send opposition party members to the parliament. And uh, it was said that the ruling party would be advantageous since the elections were held under COVID uh, conditions. But for the first time since independence, uh, the opposition won two digit seats. Still, control from the top extends to grassroots uh, organizations in Singapore. Therefore, the challenge ahead is great in terms of how and to what extent democratization will proceed. Thank you very much for your kind attention. I will stop here. Thank you very much, Professor Tomura. So the political stability of the global system steady state and the governance, uh, which has efficient uh, uh, economy, is uh, quite remarkable. And uh, the time was uh, only 10 minutes uh, today, but uh, you were able to explain this. It is a small country, so this kind of authoritarianism is uh, stable. But if you look at Hong Kong, um, maybe the size of the country is not necessarily uh, valid. And so as you have uh, discussed the ideology and social engineering and the institutional design has to be carefully looked at. So now uh, our, we are running out of time, but I'd now like to proceed to the discussion and then there will be Q&A afterwards. And so uh, please uh, send in your Q&A. Now we have all the panelists, all the speakers. Was from 1948 to 1965 that all the countries that were discussed today became independent. And back then, uh, the internal conflict or territory issues, as well as fragile economy, are the challenges that they are faced with. But 60 years or 70 years later, when we look at the result of the nation building, uh, the achievement is quite different. In terms of nation building, that is a common thread of the volume three. And as uh, Dr. Nemoto states in his chapter, it is a quite a complex topic. And therefore, I'd like to offer three points for discussion. First, as Dr. Aizawa mentioned, it is about administration, such as security, the financial crisis, health care, infrastructure, military, among others. Uh, the, whether there is a structure to offer such administrative service or not, that's uh, the first important point. And who are the legitimate members of that nation for unity of the nation? Even when there is functioning administrative regime, who are the legitimate citizens? Who are the legitimate members? Without consensus on that, the nation would eventually become unstable. And even when members are identified, uh, they have to make a decision collectively. But what, what, what kind of rules are there underlining uh, that uh, decision? And that's another important point, as uh, Dr. Tanaka mentioned in his keynote pre, uh, presentation, that's related to democracy as well. So the, the rule game, the nation building, administrative, administrative capacity, 
from those three aspects, we see a wide variety of uh, the status uh, among different countries. Especially under COVID-19 pandemic, we see whether the healthcare administration is working or not. A country like Singapore, the control is there. But in the case of Indonesia, we see the uh, the crisis of uh, the uh, the failure of the uh, healthcare system uh, with a pandemic spreading, and uh, the statistics are not fully established. Uh, they have a difficulty in identifying uh, the, those that are in close contact with uh, the, the carriers, and that is true for the Philippines as well. And in the case of the uh, unity or nation integration, Myanmar is a typical example of uh, the country in the critical situation. As we heard earlier, uh, due to the military coup d'etat, uh, the the 200,000 people were displaced uh, with 900 the citizens uh, were killed, and uh, the the government that was uh, the selected by the civil election uh, was toppled, and also the Rohingya uh, situation is another critical situation. As of 20th century, the military used to hold uh, the 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 part used to be the part of the government, but then uh, the eventually in 1998. Uh, they became part of administration and the the division within the country uh the such movement started to dwindle and uh they would never aim at uh, the citizens and uh that, that is true for the philippines as well now, why is that the situation is so diversely different among different countries and where are they heading toward first about the uh, myanmar dr nemoto i have a question 70 years later uh 70 years after the independence why is that uh, the rule uh, the the game was not created according to political science eventually uh, due to the uh the violence uh, the eventually major actors would agree on the rule of the common rule of games and yet that is not the case in myanmar why is that that's a question that i'd like to ask of dr nemoto May I enumerate all the questions that I have prepared? The next question is about the relationship between the the, the government versus military. In the case of Indonesia, after democratization, the military was no longer part of the government, and therefore Indonesia is considered to be the successful case. So, Dr. Aizawa, with Myanmar in her mind, why is that in Indonesia, the the military started to uh, be dedicated to the maintenance of security? So first, Dr. Nemoto, for, followed by Dr. Aizawa. And thank you for the question. Why the common rule game was not created in Myanmar? In short, the Myanmar national military considered that uh, the common rule was created and uh, the according to that uh, the violent uh, the, the exercise of force is concentrated in military and uh, the citizens would not accept that and this they hate or they uh, reject civil control civilian control that is uh, the military would never be under civilian control the for all other administrative functions uh, then uh, it could be under civilian control but uh, not the military according to the constitution because 14 years after or, or the, during the first 14 years since the uh, independence uh, they were so uh, disillusioned by the result of democracy uh, democratic uh, parliament that is why uh, the military was determined not to be part of the or under civilian control and since 1962 until today, that is still maintained. And also in the case of Myanmar military, they have created economic uh, interests that would feed uh, that, that uh, they can feed themselves. Uh, that dates back to 1950s. Uh, the except for the time of nationalization, it was military that owned uh, the industrial group. And now there are two huge holding companies. 
and uh, the dividend is paid to the uh, the top officers of the Minister of Defense. And in fact, the dividend paid to them is uh, the uh, more than the national defense budget. In fact, it is more than 250 billion uh, that is uh, allocated as the military budget. And uh, the dividend paid to them from the industrial groups are more than that. And therefore, they don't have to uh, the uh, compromise uh, with the citizens. And uh, they only uh, refer to that role. And uh, also, they consider themselves as uh, the the government, uh, the army, uh, that having uh, fighting all the 73 years. Of course, in case of invasion, then uh, they are supposed to fight. But in many cases, it is citizens within the uh, Myanmar Federation that uh, they uh, aim at with their guns. Except for the time uh, from 1949 to 1950s, uh, when the uh, China, a uh, Chinese army invaded uh, Myanmar, except for the period, it is always uh, the Myanmar citizens that uh, the Myanmar uh, army was fighting against. And in other words, the military considers that uh, those that will not uh, follow uh, their order, uh, then they are enemies, and therefore. Uh, they, they consider those citizens that will not abide by the rules of the, the army. Uh, they are enemies, and therefore, uh, they are attacked, they are abused, uh, they are tortured. And the military consider that is uh, legitimate. After 1990s, it was China and Russia uh, that always supported Myanmar. Therefore, uh, they, even when the... Uh, the, the G7 nations or Western countries uh, they were against them. Uh, they could rely on China and Russia. And the during 20th century and uh, even during this century, we see the, uh, the ruling by the military. But in the case of Myanmar, it has been uh, maintained from a long time ago. In other words, the, the military ruling in 21st century is no different uh, from what was established during 20th century. So characteristics of the military in Myanmar, it could uh, date back to 1950s. And the, for the first uh, 14 years since the independence, because of the failure of the, uh, the parliamentary democracy, uh, they hate and reject the civilian control. The question is how they can change uh, the the Myanmar military, whether it could be uh, disbanded, uh, discharged, and uh, restructured or reestablished again, whether they could uh, divorce them to uh, the accept civilian control. I really envy in Niger. There was a time when in Niger used to. Uh, be the role model of Myanmar. And uh, then uh, there was a democratization of Indonesia, and therefore, uh, they, from Myanmar uh, military, military point of view, they consider Indonesian army betray them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Professor Aizawa. Why the military left the uh, political scene quietly? If you thought that I wrote uh, to that effect in my chapter, maybe I did not uh, do the right job. Indonesia was skillful not uh, because it uh, actually separated the uh, uh, army from uh, polit politics and just um, made them insist on defense, but 1988-89 uh, political reform period trust of uh, the army was lost. In each region, there was a uh, human rights violation and all sorts of violence. And that was actually came to the fore. So they had to create a new system. So the army it is impossible for the army to play a role of the pillar of this uh, nation, and that was a consensus of the people. 
but I said that they were skillful because they did not. Uh, they knew that the army was powerful, so they did not marginalize the army per, uh, 100 percent because it's dangerous. In 1940s and in 1960s, if uh, the army is marginalized, uh, it results to a harsh violence. They knew that from the experience. So what they did was the key was the decentralization. So budget was allocated to regions. So incentives of the army moved from the center to the regions in order to establish a strong position in the center, it will not be uh, profitable for the army. So if you, uh, for example, uh, military personnel retires, it can become a mayor or governor in regions. Then, of course, it can use the budget allocated to the regions. So where they find that interest? As uh, Professor Suzuki said, by changing the rule of the game, uh, they let the, the army participate in regional politics, not the central politics. They participated in micro politics, and uh, this was a soft landing for Indonesia. In case of Thailand, or it's different from Thailand and Myanmar, because there wasn't confrontation uh, between politicians and military. We often say that when the military loses an enemy, they will create another enemy. Takshin was an uh, example. Myanmar is the same. Situation is the same in Myanmar. So we do not have this uh, confrontation of which one is legitimate, uh, uh, the military control or civilian control. Actually, military, uh, mili mili the military is, is a part of this uh, a member who take responsibility. Because uh, their seniors who used to uh, be in the army are now in, uh, become politicians, so they cannot really uh, uh, oppose the current uh, politicians. Mr. Habibi, because it was a short period administration, did not uh, bring about good results, but they actually take in, to, in, in the military in the regional politics. So change the incentive of military and uh, make them uh, obey a uh, democratic uh, rules. In that sense, I mean, that is the factor why uh, Indonesian democratization made a soft landing. But looking back the last several years, researchers of Indonesian politics feel that the in democracy in Indonesia is facing crisis. I think uh, that feelings are increasing. Private uh, capital and uh, Islamist, they have strong influence on uh, policy making and anger to income gap. And under Suharto, there was an authoritarian issue. From the textbook, Indonesia, at the end of 20th century, it democratized, and the democracy took uh, root. It's a success story. But from uh, Professor Aizawa, is that the real story, or can you write a different uh, story, as uh, Suksan said? authoritarianism versus democracy, but the, the demo there, there is still resilience in democracy in Indonesia. What's marginalized, nice, is Islamist, but the, that is controlled. So the uh, sect which uh, denies a uh, nation state is the one who is marginalized. So that is the policy, and the other fac the factions or other sect sec sectors of Islam Islamists 
are actually included uh, in the party politics with by weakening their strength. And I think this is all based on the competition of uh, party politicians. Of course, we cannot uh, forecast what's going to happen in the future. Uh, National Intelligence Department's uh, role is increasing. And policy-wise, there is an authoritarian policy uh, promoted. But I do not think there will be a coup d'etat or uh, going back to a uh, military rule, I don't think that will win uh, the uh, heart of the people. I do not uh, deny the role of uh, military in party po uh, politics of Indonesia, but it will not uh, deny party politics nor uh, legitimacy of elections. But the democracy and the liberalism, you might be confused. So democracy is not denied, but liberalism is uh, denied. That's the current situation, but it's for now. We don't know what's going to happen after one year. This might be a wrong conclusion after one year. Authoritarian nostalgia. The Philippines is also, also uh, referred to when we talk about this word. In the, Philipp the Philippines uh, seems to face a different uh, challenge. There's a, prof a very able professional bureaucracy who are good at the, who are involved in uh, execution of policies, but because of the uh, interference of the private sector of uh, f famed families. Uh, the bureaucracy cannot uh, ch discharge its own responsibility. So maintenance of se internal security or lack of uh, infrastructure are becoming uh, problems, and uh, that irritates uh, people. And Duterte actually uh, understood this fe these feelings, and uh, they actually take uh, try to destroy a liberal uh, system such by attacking uh, mafia and attacking uh, drugs and so on. How do you look at this? Well, of course, people feel that uh, it is uh, desirable to have good governance under democracy or Duterte is not doing uh, so well uh, fighting against the COVID. But still, because the people are disappointed by liberal democ democracy, they still support D D Duterte. I would like to know the reason for that. Thank you. Very difficult question indeed. I think uh, there are various positions on this point. I said the centrifugal state building and how to evaluate the Duterte administration. We talk about authoritarianism and democracy as a poli uh, political scientists, but uh, it's not everybody who takes that sort of uh, vantage point. Mass media, for example, some people act who advocate the democracy and rule of law have been attacked, and uh, they attack uh, the government. Uh, but uh, this is not the real picture of uh, Philippine society. I said centrifugal because the uh, people feel their life is, uh, people's life is different from what uh, the government uh, in the center is doing. That sort of feeling is uh, prevalent among people. Well, parliamentary democracy is good, uh, we understand it, but it has not much to do with the, their livelihood and their lifestyle. What's important for ordinary people is a stability and growth of economy. And Duterte administration, well, professional technocrat, technocrat have been achieving the economic growth. So it has, it's not so different from Aquino administration. 
So even though he takes a violent and uh, actually measures, he's quite popular, or maybe in spite of, uh, because of that, uh, he is popular. The important point is uh, people who are not uh, interested in politics, how they look at the government, that uh, sort of uh, perspective has to be taken into consideration. Thank you very much. Now, Singapore. So if you look at the per capita GNI and the COVID uh, countermeasures, Singapore is one of the most efficient governments in the world. But on the other hand, as uh, Professor Tamara discussed today, against the PAP long-term rule, it is not a situation where the government will change right away, but uh, there is some dissatisfaction, especially after election in 2019. And in particular, uh, young uh, people have some dissatisfaction towards the centralized uh, government. And also from the economic perspective, the low productivity is seen to be a problem. And therefore, it is important to have uh, civic uh, liberties and uh, PAP is perhaps uh, expanding uh, the range of civic liberties, which uh, from the outside seems rational, but at the same time, they have uh, 60 years of success and they have to change that experience, which would require a lot of labor and a lot of courage. And so what I want to ask Professor Tamara, so is Singapore going to change to allow more civil liberties? And also, this is not just important for Singapore, but for the entire region. In particular, after the rise of China, good governance and uh, economic growth, it's said, is uh, realized under authoritarianism. And uh, Singapore is often cited as a good example. So Singapore's liberalization and democratization, if that is seen, then for Hong Kong and Myanmar or the people who believed in liberal uh, democracy in East Asia will be encouraged. So in Singapore, in terms of uh, uh, signs of liberalization, do you see any, Professor Tamura? Thank you very much. Roughly speaking, it will take time, but under PAP, little by little, I think civil liberties will expand because, as I said earlier, in the election last year, opposition has received more votes. And it was under COVID conditions, so people said the ruling party is absolutely advantageous, but still the people, it expresses people wanting the political change. And Li Shenlong is the son of Li Kuan Yew, and uh, by the next general election, it is said that he's going to leave the prime minister. He may uh, be uh, there a little longer, but uh, Lawrence Wong, the finance minister, is said to uh, be taking uh, uh, the succession. But uh, he has also uh, made some uh, remarks that were unpopular. So. There will be reviews of uh, weak uh, welfare policies, and they will gradually continue that. Also, there will be review of uh, inflow of foreigners, and it's a Singaporean first uh, policy, and that's uh, been taking place from about uh, 2017. And also, on a grass up to a grassroots level, the PAP uh, rule is uh, very pervasive. So what are you going to democratize? If you democratize one aspect, then everything will collapse. So they will take small steps. And so the opposition party, politicians, uh, freedom of speech uh, could uh, be expanded because they got two-digit seats and therefore the leader of the opposition would uh, be able to gain uh, some uh, more uh, authority, and they will have a office to work from. And it is said that 5,000 volunteers uh, were working for him in last uh, year. So uh, opposition party politicians uh, will be allowed by the government, so their uh, actions and uh, speeches have to be allowed. Therefore, for the 
uh, speech and the action of the opposition that will be allowed. And then in the past, uh, there were uh, defamation charges, but I think uh, they will gradually stop that. So uh, from there, I think uh, there will be uh, little steps forward for democratization, but it will still take a lot of time. And I think that the next Prime Minister, Lawrence Wong, in order to improve his legitimacy, he will have to take such measures. Thank you very much. Well, our time is up, but I think since this is the final session, we can extend. And therefore, there are three Q questions and answers. And therefore, I would like to ask uh, each of the speakers to speak. Uh, that is, uh, this is about the federal system of President Duterte. I'm sorry, I pressed the wrong button. I think there are three key points here. One is this uh, federation system in the Philippine politics uh, stage. Uh, this is uh, one drama that's uh, seen. In other words, uh, when the Duterte administration was born uh, at the time, he was dependent on the ruling party, and uh, the, he wanted the support of the owners. And during the election and immediately after, uh, you could say that was uh, deciding his positioning of uh, the uh, federation system. But the Imento family is uh, now uh, rather isolated. And this uh, issue is uh, almost a symbol and in actuality there was the decentralization law in 1995 1991 and a lot of authority shifted so it's not clear what is meant by the federation system and i think uh, uh, you know of course there's the bp L, uh, district uh, law that was uh, established. So the autonomous uh, region issue has been uh, legally resolved. So exactly who is it that's asking for this kind of uh, federal system? That's the second point. And then thirdly, if uh, people are going to dwell on this, this has to do with the Constitution, and they will have to revise the Constitution. Change of the Constitution means that it will have an impact on other areas. And uh, so uh, whether to realize this uh, federal system, uh, there is another dimension. And by changing the Constitution, the Duterte family might uh, prolong uh, their uh, power. So then that becomes not an issue of the federal system, but of the constitutional system. That's all. Thank you very much. Next is uh, Professor Nemoto. There is uh, the NUG and minorities that are collaborating to confront the military. Well, thank you for the question. Uh, that is uh, NUG. There's NLD led by Aung San Suu Kyi, and then there is the cooperating minority organization, and they have cr together created uh, this government, and they have collaborated. But uh, there are also minority uh, factions that have some distance with the NUG, and basically that's the case. But uh, NUG and minority uh, activities, uh, you have to understand what the difference is. In other words, you, if you focus on the military organization, most or all of them are in mountains and highlands. And so to be extreme, since independence up to this day, uh, they have been fighting with the Myanmar National Army. And you can say that Myanmar is a country where a civil war has continued for this long. So in the mountains and in highlands, uh, there is the battle between minority and the national military, which will intensify. And uh, uh, some uh, minority people want to receive uh, military training and then uh, battle the uh, not, uh, the government uh, forces, and that has already happened in part. However, NUG is dependent on the plain area, and 
they, they have uh, collaboration with minority groups there. And in terms of, well, it's difficult to think about the military behavior because in the plains area, the military has the advantage and therefore it will have to be a struggle not of uh, weapons, but rather of uh, uh, speech. However, if they are uh, disobedient, uh, they is a possibility that they could be killed. So in order to protect themselves, they might uh, take up arms. And uh, there is uh, a, a justification applied uh, to that. And uh, between uh, the uh, minority and the military, of course, the national uh, army has uh, the advantage. But the uh, naval forces cannot be used in mountains and highlands. So there is a limit. Then what about the uh, the uh, army troops? Well, uh, well, uh, oftentimes uh, they are advantageous, and it's true that uh, they have more arms. But for example, Russia sells uh, arms to both the national military and uh, the minority uh, groups. So that is a rather unfortunate reality, and so. It is difficult to very simply evaluate the difference in the two sides. Now, finally, uh, Professor Tamara, this is about the PAP's uh, COVID uh, measures. Thank you for the question. So from an early time, uh, the Singaporean government has a lockdown called circuit breaker. They didn't call it lockdown because uh, they didn't want the name. but. Uh, it's essentially the same, and they did something called the circuit breaker. In other words, this is uh, operation to contain COVID. And uh, if you violate, then there are big fines and sometimes even imprisonment. And even if they relax the rules somewhat in order to grasp people's uh, behavior, there are apps on smartphones to monitor what they do. And when entering public buildings, you have to use the smartphone to enter. And then when leaving, it that information is also captured. So it, it is a very uh, hard-handed uh, uh, measure by the PAP. However, in Singapore, what was epic making in terms of COVID was uh, that 90% of the infected were foreign laborers who are engaged in so-called the uh, 3K uh, work. So Singaporeans normally don't come into contact with them. It is usually that they live in dorms in the suburbs. They come by trucks to the cities, and then they go back to the dorms. So uh, they have only seen these workers uh, either uh, on the, the buses or uh, on, on the uh, at work. So uh, what kind of dorms do they live in? What kind of food do they eat? Well, uh, newspapers uh, had to report that uh, eight to 10 people uh, had to sleep in uh, th uh, three uh, uh, stage beds, and uh, there were no uh, showers and toilets. And uh, well, some Singaporeans uh, wanted to deliver some uh, lunch or some water to them. And so um, this is, uh, uh, in other words, a problem of uh, reviewing the treatment of these workers. And this was one of the uh, hot points for the election last year. So this was unexpected for the Singaporean government, but uh, the treatment of the foreign workers has now been known by the people. And uh, so I think that uh, it's possible that COVID could uh, open up new uh, political aspects. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We had to extend by 10 minutes. But I would like to close uh, the third session here. Professor Nemoto, Professor Aiza, Professor Takagi, Professor Tamara, and also the participants who submitted questions. I thank you from the bottom of my heart.